those and then get into the topic if you think sounds, you'd like. To, sounds like a plan. Do you want to kick it off? I could do that. Uh, <laughs> why not? I was going to say ladies first, but you uh, <laughs> you offered. So, um, well, I'm a uh, Chris Shea, and uh, I'm a counselor by training. Um, I'm also a blogger and an author and uh, founder of uh, Life's Journey Life Coaching um, and uh, really happy to be on the Blab talking about um, a topic that I really like, uh, mindfulness, and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get some good uh, good interaction going and mm -hmm. we'll take yeah. it from there. So, Lisa? Yeah. Very good. Yep. And my name is Lisa DeLay. I'm a recent podcaster as of April. And uh, we're this is our first time co-hosting. Chris and I are taking yes, a is. stab at co-hosting and seeing how it works. I was really interested in co-hosting because I, I don't like to just be the one chatterbox, just, hey, here's everything I know. And I like the the collaboration and I like um, the process of you know answering questions and, and kind of doing things collaboratively with mm -hmm. for people out on asking questions and contributing and also co-hosting it makes it easier too if you're fielding questions or if you're just you know wanting to see if people have comments and being able to kind of be more democratic about that sort of thing. So I was kind of curious, how would co-hosting go? And of course, you never really know till you do it. <laughs> so <laughs> might as well give it a try. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. So I've been um, writing and blogging for quite a while, and uh, also just uh, starting the live stuff very recently in the last month or two. And and uh, I can hear you typing. It sounds like incredibly <laughs> loud in my ear. Uh -oh. Uh -oh, <laughs> gonna, sorry about that. No big. <laughs> Not a problem. I'm just going to turn you down a little bit, so no big deal. But that's a good thing to know. I, I was later. spreading the word as, uh, <laughs> as I'm listening to yeah, you. And do that. That's good. Because I think it's better that it's better that we know, like, okay, so when you type, it's going to be loud. And I, I'm not sure if if, um, if earbuds are going to be the thing to do or, like, a headset like I have. So it's, we're all testing. You know, it's all we're all in beta. Blab's in beta. We're in beta. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and you probably heard me well because I'm using the internal microphone. So that's um, going to be much closer to the keyboard. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I have a headset similar to yours, and yeah, I also the... have my backup handheld. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, we could try a couple different things see, see how it works. works. Yeah, and I that's that's true. The the mic right by the keyboard is going to pick up all that different stuff. Yeah. And I've tried so many different things with with podcasting too. Um, I, one of my first podcasts, as I was talking, I was playing music through the whole thing. Later on, I listened to it. I was like, wow, what was I thinking? That sounds ridiculous. I can't even oh, no. hear it. It's all music, you know. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's a total, totally a learning process. And Exactly. And, it's uh, trial and error. and We're all figuring it out. And uh, to yeah. me, that's part of the mindfulness. We're living in the moment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> figuring yeah. it out and... You know, hopefully people stick around while we do so. <laughs> well, in terms of mindfulness, when did you kind of get started in in thinking in those terms, and and uh, how has that kind of evolved in your in your spiritual practice or in sort of in your life? Well, I would say that mindfulness has been with me really since uh, my late teens, early twenties, but it wasn't called mindfulness then. Hmm. So. Um, I was really uh, deep into uh, spirituality at that time and uh, in my studies and in, in my profession. And so I was doing a lot of work on uh, spiritual meditation, spiritual reading. And, you know, what I now reflect on, that's mindfulness. We, we were putting ourselves in that moment, uh, you know, truly feeling what was in that moment. And when I think back to a lot of my spiritual directors, they used all that language without the word. Hmm. Later on, I got into a counseling and I spent a couple decades doing that. And again, a lot of things I would tell my clients as far as, you know, focusing on the moment and, and learning from the past, don't dwell in the past. Uh, again, using that language, I, I really got into the mindfulness when I heard about uh, DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. Oh, wow. And a lot of that is taking mindfulness uh, you know, with it. So um, that, you know, kind of helped. And then for myself personally, this is a way that I can begin to relax. Mm -hmm. uh, stop being the anxious person all the time. And, uh, you know, so I started trying to practice what I preach. 
and uh, you know, see where that would go. And um, you know, the the more I was doing it, the more I got into it, and then eventually uh, noticed that it's actually called mindfulness. <laughs> right. And uh, kind of went from there. Well, you know, I know you work a lot with people who are in recovery or in, and having uh, trouble with addiction, and I'm sure that plays a lot into what you do and work with them, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. A, a lot of, you know, working uh, on that side for staying in the moment, because when you're dealing with addiction, especially someone who is actively trying to get out of the addiction, trying to work on their recovery, the more they work on that, the more they dwell in their past, all the things they did, the people they hurt, and mm -hmm. that begins to interfere with the recovery process, all of those mm -hmm. resentments and the guilt, uh, which then gets them thinking in the future. You know, mm -hmm. so what have I done in the past that's going to mess up my future? Can I get a job? Do I still have a family? Do I still have a spouse? Mm -hmm. You know, all of those things are playing, and what they were missing was, well, what's happening right this second? What are you doing right now? What are you feeling right now? And, and helping to guide them to, you know, learn from that past, but the past is over and they're creating mm. their present, which is going to be a whole new past. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I think, um, you know, mindfulness too, in, in, in my, I guess you could say my interaction with it, mindfulness, what seemed outside of the Christian context, uh, which was my, tr which is my tradition and my spiritual formation. But of course it, like you're saying it was, it was different language, but it was really talking about the exact same thing. I mean, what, right. what is, how are you going to have fruit of the spirit if you're not mindful? I have no idea how you could, you know, like it doesn't, right. it's not going to work. <laughs> no. you, can't be, you can't be spiritually aware. <laughs> right. And have fruit of the spirit and be, thoughtless and not paying attention and in your own head and mm -hmm. oblivious. I mean, it, it just doesn't even fit. And so I began to see more of, you know, sometimes language is this, is this bad container for, right. for what you're trying to say. And so, you know, my, my ideas of what that could mean and, and the fullness of what that could mean and how helpful some of these ideas could mean if I, um, you know, learn from different traditions, but also just apply them in richer ways and, and learn from more people that way. And so I have gained a lot recently, more recently from Buddhist thought and Buddhist tradition and really, um, have gained a richness in some of the Zen ideas that when applied to Christianity, because sometimes, you know, even though Christianity is actually an Eastern religion, Middle Eastern at least, right. but also exactly. plenty, of, plenty of Eastern stuff going on there but often thought of in Western context because of Rome <laughs> um, exactly. is, that, is that it's much more in, in Eastern culture, just by, just by default, you're going to have a holistic view of, of things. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have those dualities uh, about the material and the immaterial and, and so on. And you're going to have a much more holistic look at, at existence really. Right. And, and so bringing in those things is actually it, everything clicks so much better as you as you start applying those things. And so what what some of the Eastern even uh, Eastern Christians bring in is the immediacy mm -hmm. uh, that makes it much richer, that that immediacy of um, kingdom kingdom come now and kingdom coming, you know, and, and those and those terms um, make the experience right now, the spiritual experience right now, that much richer. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, definitely. You know, and, and when you look at that history, you know, again, they weren't using those words, but, you know, look at the uh, early and, and into the transitioning of a Judaism and a split into a Christianity, you know, you had traditions even in, in Judaism of people going out into the desert, spending time alone, you know, focusing on that present moment. You know, and then you get the early Christians who are doing some similar, uh, you know, activities. And so mm -hmm. that's, you know, I, I think the, the Christian scripture is very rich with mindfulness speak. Mm. But because it is, you know, seeped in the Christianity where, where we do make that split between Christianity as Western and everybody else as Eastern, yeah. that we're missing those moments 
you know, uh, of all of this mindfulness that's in there, all of the Zen type meditations and, and all of that is there. It's just not in the words. We're not trained culturally, educationally, you know, whatever to uh, notice that it is just not there, mm-hmm. you know? So if we shift the mindset and, and I do like that mindfulness is now termed that way, because for those who maybe, you know, would practice Zen or Buddhism or a, a spiritual meditation, yeah. if you put that into the counseling field or, or you really help people to do it, you know, they'll say you're not, you know, you're, you're just a, a religious freak or whatever. Well, you put this into a scientific term, you yeah. put some evidence behind it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, everybody says, oh, this is great. This is wonderful. You know, look, look what we've got. Well, <laughs> same stuff. Yeah. Same stuff, but you changed the word. You took it out of religion and you gave yeah. some evidence. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that it did, you know, yeah. uh, it, it brings a legitimacy to things that, you know, I think a lot of people on the spiritual side have been doing it. And mm-hmm. now we can legitimately bring it into um, more of a professional, so to speak, practice. Yeah. And, and when a lot of people use, yeah. So what you're saying is a lot of people, when they use the term mindfulness, they're not, it's non-sectarian. It's not right. saying this branch of Buddhism or, you know, uh, this, this teacher over here or this Zen master over here. It, it is just kind of, it's mostly without baggage, maybe not so much for Christians. I don't know. It depends on who you're talking to. Exactly. But I think that then there is a lot of science that behind it, like you're saying, these studies are come out, coming out and they're showing, you know, biofeedback studies or mm-hmm. brain scans. And they're saying, you know, having people focus on certain things and creating awareness for certain yeah. people, then they're doing the brain scans and they're like, check it, check out this, this difference here and check out yeah. these new pathways that are getting yeah. formed by well, prayer and, and meditation know, and the rest. Oh, exactly. And, and that's some of the uh, recent uh, studies coming out of Harvard. We're talking, mm-hmm. you know, what you're saying, you know, the, the new pathways that they're finding as they do the brain scans and even the fact that they're saying that a healthy meditation uh, can uh, grow gray matter. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the, that that's huge. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the sense of, of its potential. And, and you know, I, I wonder what that also means for people with uh, certain brain damage. Is there now a way of the possibility of growing other brain matter and then reworking those channels away from the damaged areas into the new? Yeah. And, and to me, it just opens it up to, you know, fascinating possibilities and all through what we've been doing for thousands of years. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's funny because why would prayer and meditation stand the test of time unless it worked to transform people? I mean, it's just even just in, in just pure evolutionary terms of anthropological terms. We think that it it's oh, it lasted because people are superstitious, blah, blah, blah. It probably lasted because it works and yeah. people calm down and become more civil and become more good. And and then it, it relieves anxiety and, you know, helps mm. communities and, and so on. And then, and then, and then it's demonstrable, de- demonstrative in, in studies where it's actually, you know, you can see the physical scans and they're like, oh, this actually works. You know, and I, I work with, with prisoners. I think I, I mentioned to you and I told them, right. you know, I told them straight up, I, I work with, I worked with a group that was, um, it was, they call it non-denominational in the federal prison. I think what they mean is, um, ecumenical but because it's not really non-denominational but however they were yeah. saying it and we were t- we were talking about meditation and prayer and i was telling them about um because my my graduate degree was in spiritual formation and so transformation is kind of like that's what i that's what i really care about and and are you know can people change and can people improve and how does that happen and and so this is all very exciting for me when i hear things in about neuroscience i get very excited and i think yep. uh guess what people can <laughs> apparently exactly can. sometimes it doesn't seem like it and sometimes we seem to go back to our old problems and our old challenges again and again but i was mm-hmm. telling them i said you know uh you can practice your prayer and you can practice meditation and it's actually going to help you and yeah. here's here's the studies that that tell us this and you don't have to just say 
yeah, I'm, I'm doing this, you know, I'm doing this weird thing, you know, because I know I'm supposed to, but like, this is actually going to help me. And I, and, um, there's some proof, there's some, you know, empirical evidence for it. So that's kind of fun. Well, I guess well, one of these days it'd be interesting to see our doctor is going to be writing prescriptions for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, if it works that well. <laughs> yeah, it'd be cheaper than a lot of the medication, that's for sure. Um, Very much so, and healthier, too. <laughs> I guess in terms of, we were going to talk a little bit more about probably fear as well, and overcoming right. fear and how mindfulness can help that. Um, in terms of, like, I guess, how do you see how do you see that playing out? Or maybe how have you noticed that? in your own life, um, dealing with different sorts of fears and, and how mindfulness has helped you? Well, again, for me, a lot of the mindfulness is somewhat new in, in the last number of years. Uh, so, you know, when I kind of speak to it on, on two different levels in the sense of, you know, what was my thinking of fear, oh, maybe a decade, decade and a half ago, you know, would be a fear that, would be something stopping me uh, from doing what would be probably very positive for me. Uh, but you get a lot of these fears that would creep in, you know, and, and in counseling, you call them, you know, irrational thought patterns, cognitive, you know, uh, distortions, all these, you know, terms. But really what it is, is, you know, when you're telling yourself, you know, I'm not good enough, I can't do this, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that may be. And then you believe it. Mm. And that holds you back. And and even though I did advancements and, and I came out of myself a lot, you know, there were a lot of moments in, in my career and, and in areas that I just wasn't doing uh, those things that, that I probably could have because of what I was telling myself. When I now focus on mindfulness, you know, part of what I do in, in my writings when we talk about mindfulness is I talk about finding an inner peace and an inner peace is also talking about love. And one of the things that when you focus on doing the right and doing good and focus on love, you can't have love and fear at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I, I'm slowly, I'm not there, but, you know, I'm slowly trying to work on a mindfulness. If I stay in the present moment and do my best to do what I need to do out of love, mm. then you know, that's something that will take away that fear because I can know that what I'm doing is going to kind of be protected in that sense, you know, and, and you mm -hmm. can even look at the spiritual sense of, of you know, uh, how kind of fear coming in when you're talking about a love, you mm -hmm. know, um, the, the two are incompatible. Yeah. So that that's kind of where I'm trying to do, but but you can't do that if, if you're worried about the future or, or the past because fear is going to creep in there. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, very easy. And, and that's something I still have to keep training myself, you know, to work on. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it really, um, it's true. The one, uh, fe love pushes it out. It doesn't have, it doesn't have uh, room for it anymore and, uh, takes over. It, that's, that's interesting too. It, it, it's true. I think even when we risk um, being vulnerable with people that we love or that we are starting to trust, there could be a lot of fear in vulnerability or getting to mm -hmm. know someone on a deeper level. There can be fears and insecurities that creep in, but when you're vulnerable and that person um, reciprocates that or accepts you uh, and then there's a love that happens there, there's a you know, a kind of love, perhaps, you know, and obviously there's different levels of love and, and exactly. acceptance and things like that. But then that creates an environment that, that can cast those things aside and, and can uh, cast those fears and, and insecurities to the, to the edge. And uh, I think that's, that's an excellent point because, because fear is a very paralyzing, um, <laughs> you know, dominating thing, like a, like a monster coming in and kind of wreaking havoc sometimes. And I, um, I know that, uh, you know, people talk about it all the time with, I, I, I have an audience that is a, a lot of creative types, a lot of writers and artists and musicians and people who are doing projects and, and risking being vulnerable or yeah. trying to get something out and trying to, trying to, um, put themselves out there creatively is risky and it, it brings up a lot of insecurities and, and fear will just kind of put the brakes on. 
Yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, in, in not only my experience of, of anxiety and, and stress, what I've been working with clients in, in, you know, really deep anxieties, a lot of the root of those anxieties is the fear. Mm, yeah. You know, I mean, we call it anxiety, but the the root of that is, you know, what am I afraid of? Mm. You know, uh, and, and it's either what am I afraid of that's happening to me now which is blocking me from understanding what I can do different or, you know, the, the fears of the future, you know, and, and the more that I contemplate, you know, living in a, in a time frame that doesn't yet exist future, um, you know, that that's going to cause an anxiety because underlying that is the fear, you know, that yeah. I, I don't know and it's unknown. So I'm afraid of it. Yeah. So I get anxious, you know, so, um, I think the more we can train our focus on the present moment and try to understand, you know, what right now is fearful. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and see where that goes. And, and if it is, what were you going to do to overcome it? Yeah. And what you're saying about mindfulness and awareness too, it has everything to do with that initial, like in like almost like a bodily inventory, you know, I'll be, I'll be in the car and I'll, and I'll find myself like gripping the steering wheel too hard, you know, uh -huh. like, Ugh. and I'll, I'll be like, what is wrong? Okay. I'm clenching the steering wheel, you know, and, and I'm trying to get a sense of an awareness of mindfulness. What is my body feeling? Why yeah. might my body be feeling this way? What, what is going on? What am I afraid of? What am I going through? Am I, am I too crunched for time? Am I, and there usually is some fear there. It might be fear of disappointing somebody. It might be fear of um, just not accomplishing what I was hoping to or some disappointment or, you know, some insecurity or something like that. But, it, but it's true that the more you're mindful, it's like a muscle that you build up. And the more you check in, okay, what am I feeling? You know, taking that, that, emotional inventory and and the mental inventory that you get used to checking in with yourself and kind of integrating <laughs> integrating the whole bit you know oh i think i might have lost you let me just see i don't see you there anymore where do you go so maybe you need to you might need to come back in um pop back out here so I don't know who is all listening there. If anybody is still here with me, you can give me some high fives, those double high fives there. If you can hear me and if this is still going okay, because we might have just had a uh, technical difficulty. Oh, good. Thank you, for, thank you for doing that. I'm glad you can still hear me. I don't see Chris anymore, so hopefully he will pop back in. Blab occasionally has these, these like big problems and you'll get bounced right off. And so I'm um, sorry about that, everybody. So... Um, Maybe you've had some problems with fear in the past that have stopped you. And it's it's one of those things we were talking, Chris and I were talking about being mindful and being aware. Oh, he's coming back in, hooray. Okay, hopefully he'll he'll pop back in a second. Oh, back. A, hey. <laughs> All right. We each had a time. There we go. Good. Thank you for thank you for high fiving. Now we know for sure yes. that that you can be heard. <laughs> Yeah, Excellent. you never know. I've got some high five. Sudden, Yay. The sudden ejection off of the off of the blab. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I said something blab didn't like, so <laughs> Yeah. The blab you made the blab gods angry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to appeal them later. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things I was I uh, was thinking about in terms of fear was that um Another, I, I heard this one time. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I did not invent this or anything. But that angry people are often the most fearful. Or angry people are often the most afraid. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought about that. And I. And I. And it's not the first thing you think of if you think of a, a person with a lot of like rage right under the surface, boiling under the surface, or you think of someone who's kind of flies off the handle all the time. You don't think of them as afraid. You think them as like. Oh, get it, get out of their way, you know, or right. like, whoa, look out. You think of them as maybe tough or something, but they're actually these people who tend to fly off the hang handle and be angry are actually some of the more, most afraid people you're going to ever run across. And I think when you see them that, when you can see them that way, 
uh, it, it really will shift your perspective. You can even grow into having a, a new sort of compassion for them because you realize they're dealing with a lot of extra stuff or baggage that they probably don't realize. They're probably not mindful of it. And it doesn't make you superior to them or, or anything, but no. it, it, it does give you a sense that, okay, there's, there's more going on here. This person obviously has a lot of stuff going on and um, they're not able to, to notice it yet. I don't know if, if you can speak to that at all. Right. No, I, I think that's very true because the other word that comes into play with that would be that insecurity, which, you know, I think when we look at people who are insecure, a lot of that is dealing with fear, you know, mm -hmm. that they're probably afraid of looking bad, looking like a failure. Um, you know, sometimes it, it could just be that fear that people are going to see that I'm insecure. Yeah. You know, so I, I got I got to put on the, this tough you know uh, exterior and and you know hide that. But you know, for me, when we look at this mindfulness, you're like, what is the point of mindfulness, or what is the goal of, of you know mindfulness? And and the the approach that I've been taking is you know that it's there to help us to find inner peace. Mm -hmm. So if I do have a deep rooted fear, like an insecurity that I'm covering up by say an aggressive you know side i'm definitely not going to be at peace mm -hmm. and even if i'm not mindful enough to know exactly what's going on i'm sure most people are, are self-aware that they're not at peace mm -hmm. and you know what what are we going to do to try to find that peace you know and, and part of it is going to have to be acknowledge the fear and, and i think that's the hardest thing you know, for most of us to do is to, you know, even acknowledge that we have fears. Fear is weakness. Our, you know, society says not to, you know, bring in, you know, allow weakness. Okay. Should we let Lance in here? Let's oh, see let's Lance... let Lance in. <laughs> hey, Lance. Hey, hey, Lance, welcome. Hi, thank you for letting me in. You're I welcome. Just wanted to, um, before you, don't do that until I'm done. Oh. My daughter's about to sharpen pencils. That would definitely be too loud. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wanted to address what you had just said, Chris, um, about insecurities and everything like that. I, for many, many, many years, have been a very short-fused, uh, hot-tempered human being. And I always tried to, not tried, but my mind was always putting myself down for it, uh, always talking to myself, like, why are you so hot? Why are you so mm -hmm. short-fused? Why are you all of these things? And it's just, and I've been meditating many years on and off, sometimes more serious in my practice than other times. And just very, very recently at the age of 44, I accepted the fact that I was made with a very short fuse. That's me. It's not that it's a, a deficit. It's just who I am. And just being open to that has, it's gone now. It, it completely disappeared the second that I completely accepted it and didn't judge myself from maybe not being as in control or being able to compartmentalize like another right. human being. I just owned it. I owned, I owned a deficit. And, you know, I, I heard you saying that. And then I was listening and I heard you saying that and it sounded very relevant. So now my daughter's going to sharpen her pencils and I'm going to take off. But um, it's, wow. I, I actually did that in my life and it was very helpful. So I, I look forward to listening. Great. That's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for sharing that. And, you know, it, it's interesting how that, you know, acknowledgement in and of itself helped to, you know, take that away where, you know, for a lot of people, it's, you know, the acknowledgement and then work on it. Right. You know, and and for you, it was just acknowledging this right. is who I am and now I'm a different person. <laughs> right. I tried to push, I tried to meditate it away. I tried to push it away. I tried to do everything to do everything. So, so much resistance. And then once mm -hmm. I, when, when, I, when I just completely embraced it, I mean, I, 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 I'm conscious to watch these situations where I know I'm going to snap. I'm, I'm more, you know, obviously right. watching them closer. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm not judging myself for them. So I look forward to oh, listening. And that's it's really neat. Thank you, Lance. Uh, you know, that's interesting. I think that was like a move of love for himself, a, a self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's like it cured him. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, like, not to be trite or, or anything no, like that. I, but that's, a, that's like a brilliant point. It's like, this is who I am, and I'm not going to fight it. I'm, this is me. Right. And it's weird, you know, it was like, okay. <laughs> well, and, and, and I think, you know, it, it 
probably comes a, a bit to what we were talking about earlier about love, you know, that when you finally accept who you are, you know, the good, the bad, the, the pretty, the ugly, whatever it may be, just to say, this is who I am right now. I, I think that is a sign of self-love. You know, so I'm going to love me who I am today. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have things to work on or I'm going to, you know, just be this horrible person because, hey, that's just who I am. But to be able to acknowledge this is who I am, I think brings in a love. And as we were saying, love draws out the fear. You can't have both. You know, so it it almost wonders, you know, I'm I'm not going to speak for Lance, but uh, that's kind of what I was hearing in his story that when he began to self-love. Huh. The yeah. fear and then therefore the anger. Yeah, that's that's beautiful too. And I, I've heard this. I've heard this before in 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 God language. You could you could say the same thing as as divine love or or whatever. But um, that that God simultaneously hugs you and kind of kicks you in the butt at the same time. <laughs> You know, it's kind of yeah. like the, the full the full embrace of divine love, but also like doesn't want you to just be at your worst or, you know, once once improvement for you, wants the best for you, it kind of the kick in the pants mm-hmm. and the full the full embrace, which is what like an, any best friend would want or what any, you know, right. what any true best friend or soul friend would want for you is that, yeah, you're OK. You're totally OK right now. I'm not I'm not going to you know, it's grace really is kind of what we're talking about. And yeah. and um, and I think that's, you know, when we when we feel like we've received that in in whatever form at whatever time. And then we're actually able to offer that to other people somehow in some small way or in, mm-hmm. in any opportunity where we kind of figure that out properly. Um, that is one of those like very fruitful, extraordinarily fruitful things that I, I've seen. Um, I've, I've witnessed other people do it and, and find what seems like miraculous results. Mm-hmm. And I've seen people turn around from like where you wouldn't think there was any hope for them on, on a myriad of different, different areas, you know, where you would think right. this is, this is going to end really badly or, you know, whatever. And, and then things just turn around because something clicked and it was because some grace just happened and it just clicked. And it's, it's just amazing to see that it gives you like, it gives you some hope in, in humanity or <laughs> in how this whole thing works, you know, <laughs> exactly. Sometimes, sometimes all you hear, all you ever hear is like bad news and unhappy endings or something, you know, and, and, uh, and occasionally you'll see these things w- look like miracles, but actually think it's more like everything just went as it was supposed to. Yeah, you know? it, it, exactly. You know, and, and really what all of that stuff that you're saying really goes into you can't find that unless you're in that present moment because all of that gets missed you know and and for me it's really hard i find at least it's hard for me to put into words what exactly that means when we say like living in that present moment you know and and um and that'd be something you know people who are listening to us can if they have some way to put in the words as well but you know, I, I kind of just put it more as, you know, when, when you're looking at the past, you know, we're not there and you're looking at the future, we're not there. So it, it's, you know, the right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, that, that's a, a feeling that's very difficult for me to put into words. Yeah. You know, what, what that's like to really just focus on the here and now. Yeah. Now, do you ever listen to um, Krista Tippett and, and her podcast called On Being? Do you ever listen to that ever? No, I haven't heard of that one. Oh my gosh. I think this is one I'm going to need to This check is out. this is going to change your life. I'm so happy I can tell you about about her. Cool. cool. <laughs> so Krista Tippett is she just got a National Humanities Award from Obama, I think, in this year. So okay. so she's she's getting some recognition she well deserves, but she's out of uh, Minneapolis and she's been at this for a long time since just after just after 9/11, I I think and she, it, she mm-hmm. has a she has an MDiv from somewhere, but she's been in journalism and on NPR for a long time. Okay. Anyway, one of I'll, I'm going to send you a link and actually I'm going to yeah, put this do. I'm going to put this up my um, the specifically this episode, which was about mindfulness. Um, this woman and I'm, I'm totally blanking on her name because I'm just going extemporaneously right now. But um, this woman was talking about mindfulness, and I, I want to 
I'm getting to a point of asking you a question about what you think about meditation and mindfulness in, in a second. But um, so Krista Tippett just has fantastic episodes on, they're released on Thursdays and I'll put, uh, I'll send you something to your email, but at, at sparkmymuse.com for anybody else who wants to, to get this specific episode or you can go to onbeing.org to, to get the general podcast. Mm -hmm. There's a blog there too. And actually Sharon, this is so cool. Sharon Salzberg, she's um, one of the foremost uh, Buddhist, uh, Western Buddhist meditation, mindfulness Mm -hmm. people in in the u.s she's she just agreed to be on my podcast so i'm like oh, oh my gosh oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. An, icon, an icon an icon yeah. like, it's so busy that she can't even do it till like march <laughs> i'm like hey i can wait <laughs> but um so this woman who was on the show whose name escapes me said something really fascinating and she's all about mindfulness and has done a whole bunch of studies and she one of the fa fascinating studies she did she's been doing studies since the 1970s mm -hmm. they did they did they were they did a bunch of studies on on temporal time and they took these men who are in their 80s okay um and back when this is back when 80 was actually 80 not 80 was it 60 you know as it sort of is now <laughs> exactly <laughs> which is which is a thing that this is kind of proves the point so they took them and they put them in this environment was everything was 20 years different newspapers the cars the clothing everything was different and had been adjusted for 20 years prior the unbelievable thing that happened in just 2 weeks they tested at in they tested 20 years younger cognitively, their eyesight mm -hmm. got better, their eyesight mm -hmm. got better, their hearing got better. They had actually re like reversed time essentially. And what they right. were figuring out was how, how perceived time is real reality in terms of how your brain will distinguish things. Mm -hmm. And she, the, so the question I finally am gonna be able to ask you is, she was talking about meditation as preparing for mindfulness but but not really creating mindfulness itself. And I, I thought that was kind of an interesting point that I had never really thought about, but that in meditation, she talks about, um, and she was, I think she was more referring to maybe Buddhist tradition. I'm not really yeah. sure. Is that, you know, while you're in meditation, you're actually not there right now, but you're sort of in a way preparing for being more present afterwards. Now, I was wondering what you thought about that. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an interesting concept and uh i mean have um, to think about it or something but well no i mean part of me d doesn't want to uh you know kind of like talk about an icon <laughs> well that's, that's a different, yeah that's a, yeah that's what well, we're talking um, about two different people in this case but yeah, yeah. but mm -hmm. um no I, I i think i i would agree philosophically but I would want to change the wording a bit, I think, in practice, mm -hmm. uh, where I think philosophically, I would agree with that, that, you know, how do you find the tools that you need to keep your mind focused on now? Because our, our minds do tend to wander mm -hmm. and the more they wander, the, the less we are mindful of, you know, what's going on in our bodies and all that. Like you gave the example of, you know, holding the steering wheel really tight, you know, so the mind wandered and you didn't realize you were holding it tight until your mind came back, you know, but so I can see where the longer um, you work at meditation, that you're sitting still, you're being quiet, you're training the mind, Mm. I think philosophically, I get that. That becomes the tools that you're going to need so that when you go out into the world, leave that meditation session, go out into the world, you're, you're building those tools that is going to be necessary to keep the mind focused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say in practice, though, I, I, I got a little w with the wording because isn't that act of doing the meditation in and of itself focused on the present moment? You know, is it the training tool and the action all at the same time? Well, yeah, that, that's what I was wondering. I, she would say no, but but I'm wondering if maybe the the bigger point of meditation is to that that becomes the new normal. That's the reset, right? And so, but you know, I don't know because I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure that I'm well versed in meditation enough to really say personally, but mm -hmm. I thought it was a fascinating point that she was sort of saying, but I guess suppose there's, there's lots of different sorts of meditation and right. Yeah. You know, um, and, and, and she, she was sort of saying that as one is meditating, one is sort of not actually aware in that moment, but I guess that just depends possibly on that person and what they're doing. Well, and, and yeah, it, I guess I'm looking at from my experience and, and yeah, there is a lot of forms of meditation, um, but also from my experience of really f having that time of very focused uh, attention to that moment. But I think in what you were just saying, you know, there are those people who get so deep into their meditation that it becomes almost like that out of body type experience that, that they mm -hmm. almost enter into a different realm, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if that's something that she might be speaking of, mm -hmm. you know, because that wouldn't. Well, yeah. I've never been there, but I, I, I don't know if that would necessarily be the present moment because that may even be outside of time in a certain sense, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, to have kind of that truly mystical type experience, uh, right. Right. which would prep you for the world. So I, I don't know if she's going that deep or not, but I know that's never been my experience. So, so you, you have never had any mystical experiences in meditation at all or prayer well, or depends. anything like that or? Yeah, it depends how we want to define mystical. I mean, right. <laughs> you know, have I had this, you know, like out of body or ended up somewhere else or, you know, floated and, you know, levitated or whatever, you know, none of that stuff. But um, I mean, in a sense, so does my, do I feel a closeness, a deeper closeness in those moments with God or in being mindfully spiritual? Can I acknowledge and recognize those moments that, that God does intersect in life? And, you know, that you can call them these, you know, small miracles and, mm -hmm. you know, you know, things that, that are happening that we would miss if we weren't being mindful. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, like I think if we're. It's like mm -hmm. a transcendent moment, you would say, or. Um, a transcendent moment and also a, a very real moment, you know, mm -hmm. of, yeah. you know, when. I'm trying to think as I'm talking to, you know, something that has happened, but, you know, I, I know I've had those moments where when things have happened that I, I've come back later and said, well, that had to have been God's influence, mm. you know, because it wouldn't have happened any other way, you know, mm. but to be mindful of that and to be able to recognize that, um, you know, I think if we want to say that's a mystical type of activity, then I'd have to say yes. Mm. Um but again, we're, we're going to miss those moments. And, and that's what, you know, I, I work in, in a high school and then I try to help the kids to understand, which if we don't get it, you know, it's hard for teenagers to sit in the moment. But, but you know, helping them in, in that spiritual journey of, of, you know, if you don't sit in that moment, you're going to miss those God opportunities. You know, mm -hmm. so when they talk about, you know, I don't see God in my life or I don't see these miracles and, and all that, mm -hmm. um, you know, well, I would tend to think they're happening. They're not seeing it. Right. Well, what do you do in the in that context in the high school environment? With that problem or you mean what do I do? It, yeah, what do you do? Okay. Um I uh work in the campus ministry uh program. Oh, okay. It's a uh uh Catholic school. Um okay, right. and uh so my main focus is helping the kids with their spiritual life, coordinating all of the uh, uh, prayer activities, liturgical activities, and I also run all of the retreats. Oh, okay. um, yeah. And all of our students have to go on a retreat every year. Oh. So that ends up, we split into small groups. I end up doing 14 or so retreats in academic year. Wow, uh, which that's quite a lot. Which is for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's what a other lot. job do I get to go away for? And these are overnights. So yeah. you know, take 30 to 40, you know, teenagers overnight, like wow. 14 times. <laughs> <laughs> it could either be like super awesome or like, not again. <laughs> it depends on the group. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's funny. But, <laughs> yeah, near me, I'm near the, um, the Warnersville. Um, I'm kind of near Reading, Pennsylvania, and I'm near... Mm -hmm sort of near Warnersville, the Jesuit center there at, mm -hmm. in Warnersville and it's a spiritual center. And when I was there one time 
and uh, there was a the Catholic school St. Joe's, I guess there, there must have been like a hundred boys there and they were all eating. I didn't know they would be there. And I was like on this retreat I thought would be quiet. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they were really nice guys. And, but they would go, they'd say something and they'd go, hey, huddle up. And they'd go like, Bruh! and they'd all say something. Every time someone was going to speak, they'd say this thing every time. It'd be like the mm -hmm. shout. And I was like, oh my gosh, how many times is that going to happen? But it was really neat. So it must be kind of a similar thing where they have like a required retreat that they, that they do. And I, I think right. that's fantastic to get people. I mean, just, just even limiting someone's cell phone use could practically be a retreat for this generation of kids oh, definitely. Up like that. So I mean, I think and, and that's the hard piece to do because we tell them don't bring the cell phones, don't use the cell phones yeah. and they can't do it. I mean, they don't use it in my presence because you know, they know they're in trouble in that sense, but, but I know they all have them. They didn't mm -hmm. leave them somewhere, you yeah, know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that in and of itself could be a retreat. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but uh, you know, uh, again, it's, uh, it's those moments though, when, you know, I think, you know, talking, you know, fear in, in, in my mind, it's, it's also part of expectations, mm -hmm. you know, and, and for me, and, and I should know better from working with teenagers, but I still fall into stereotyping. And I had this retreat group uh, recently took, and it turned out, it's a co-ed school, but it turned out that we had like 30 guys and five girls or something, you know, and I'm thinking, great. <laughs> if you got this many guys, on a retreat, this is going to be a disaster because typically teenage guys not going to want to do retreat and talk about God and all that stuff. And I figure you intermingle some of the girls and we're good. How is this going to work? So that perspective mm -hmm. was all like, this is totally not good. So far this year, that's been the best retreat that we've had mm -hmm. wow. because those guys stepped up those guys. Mm -hmm shared they had insights that i haven't mm -hmm. heard before they got into it and i don't know mm -hmm. what it was i don't know why <laughs> don't care <laughs> again that's a god influence but mm -hmm. they got into it and it, it was something you know and, and those mm -hmm. are those moments that i walk away from that saying not only i should have known better <laughs> that got to work <laughs> with this but um <laughs> You know, that whole bit of fear that I had in that moment of, oh, no, this mm -hmm. is going to be a torturous two days mm -hmm. uh, turned out to be the best experience, you know, yet, you yeah. know, so you just never know, you know, what's going to happen in what situations. And, you know, that whole part of there was no need for any of the fear at all. Mm. Yeah. And I think I, and people can surprise you. That's the thing. You never know when the, the little miracles are going to show up and, and God's grace is going to be sufficient for, for whatever needs to happen. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is amazing. I, um, I know, um, you know, people, people often are really hard on, on younger people and they think that, yeah you know, things are going to hell in a handbasket and, you know, oh no, the, because, because of mainly technology and, and all that stuff. Right. But when it's just like any other group, uh, uh, any other generation, there's, mm -hmm. there's these big time overachievers. There's the, this 20% are going to be like major overachievers. 20% are going to be total slackers. There's going to be this big middle section, just like any other generation, exactly. basically. And exactly. there's just more of them. You know, there's, there's plenty more of them. Um, and, they're out num they've outnumbered baby boomers at this point but but i i think it's you know they mm -hmm. yeah they're immature well they're young <laughs> so, they're yeah, supposed to be course. immature <laughs> I mean, if they're not immature when they're young you know what's that's that's actually probably a problem <laughs> that so. worries me more than the teenager who's actually acting like a teenager <laughs> right. so, so yeah it's that's that's funny i um have have some some interactions with teenagers and and I'd say it's it's actually the more of the rarity that that they're disappointing than I think most yeah. of the time I'm like you know this is most of the time it's it's great and yeah. and yeah. so I I don't know I guess it just depends what you're looking for possibly but well, and, and <laughs> I think one of the things that I find interesting is you know like you're saying you know when you look at these generations and and that's when I feel like I, I sound like my parents or grandparents, you know, when you say, oh, this generation is going to ruin, you know, because mm -hmm. they said about our generation and it was said about their generation. It was said, you know, but it's interesting because some of the 
fears back in the fears, you know, fears I would have for the future and for the generations. Yeah. When, yeah. when I talk to a lot of the teenagers, you know, they share the same fears mm. of the future, you know, where mm. I'm putting it on them, you know, that they're going to cause this or there's going to be a problem. They can't handle it, whatever, you know, and, and they're looking at me saying that they have these same fears and, and they want to know how can they work on, mm. you know, fixing it or not having it happen. And it's yeah. just interesting. We're looking at the fear from two different angles, but mm -hmm. we're fearing the same thing. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and I think they they feel the added pressure, but every generation had their own big pressure, you know. Mm -hmm. And and I think um, each generation rises to meet it in their own unique way. And and uh, some they they fail in some ways and they succeed in other ways. And, and it, it will be really interesting because technology is so prominent and has so many possibilities to fix problems, but also cause unintended consequences that exactly. that are impossible to foresee that it's going to be much more complicated but also the the ability to do good mm -hmm. can happen so quickly and happen so in a sense so much more easily um that that is it's astonishing and i i never like when i was a kid and growing up in the 80s is that's when i grew up uh as a mm -hmm. kid and i would in, a, in my wildest wildest dreams would not picture this world uh, that I'm living in, and I I mm -hmm. am a geek, and I love it. I'm I'm a, into yeah. it. You know, <laughs> I'm really happy that I that I was born at the right time. You know, but um, I couldn't have I couldn't have been my wildest dreams. And I've said this to my own daughter, who's 12, and she says she can't even imagine what it'll be like in five years. Yeah. Well, <laughs> things are moving just, so quickly. Yeah. You know, I mean, to think, you know, five years ago, what was our technology? Ten years ago, what was our technology? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it seemed that all of a sudden there was no technology, you know, well, always technology. But, I mean, this modern type technology. And then all of a sudden when it came on the scene, it just flew. Yeah. You know, and, uh, yeah, for yeah. me, I mean, I, I grew up in the 80s uh, as well. And, and for me, you know, when you went from Pong to Pac-Man, that was like <laughs> you can't get any better than that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's all the more reason to practice, to really practice mindfulness. And, um, I listen to, um, see, I'm a podcast geek, basically. I'll just admit that straight up. Um, and I listen to a lot of podcasts. I won't even get into my list, but the one of them I was listening to today is called, is called Buddhist geek, I think, or something like that. And it kind of mixes technology and, and Buddhism. And I found it I found it really interesting. Yeah. And it's it's a younger, it's a younger guy, I think. I didn't check into his actual age, but I'm I'm assuming he's like late late twenties maybe. And um it's a really it's really fascinating for that particular reason that mashup is is really fascinating to me. Mm. Um, because the approach is so different than I would mm -hmm. expect and and the, that the confluence is it just puts things in a really different light and a really different perspective really practical but insightful and i just like it not not that i understand it because it, there's all kinds of terms that i have no idea what they are and sometimes i just skip those parts but um yeah. but i but i was really be, because technology has this especially for certain people has this it's this big lens to look through or it's mm -hmm. this big thing that overshadows things um, in, in a good way that it makes certain topics come into a whole new bloom right. in a whole new way. So yeah, yeah. that was, that's, I'll have to do, we'll have to do a blab on just like, just podcasts or just, <laughs> just yeah. that top, top 10. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, we should, I mean, I, I listened to a number of them, probably not as many as, as uh, you are, but uh, um, I'm, I'm working towards more, but uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, when you look at that technology, you know, if we say focused on what it can do in a positive sense, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how we can really change the world and, and change people. But uh, I think on, on the other side of it, and uh, I, I wrote a couple of uh, blog posts on, on this topic uh, a while back, but, you know, you, you begin to wonder if a lot of the fear and anxiety that people uh, demonstrate, you know, uh, in today's world is partly because of the technology and partly in, the, in that sense that we're so overwhelmed with all of the affairs of the world. 
Oh. You know, yeah. so, you know, when you look at, you know, we now have access to every tragedy that happens anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. We know about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's interesting to me to, to think about it. Is that part of why people are more fearful of the future, are more mm -hmm. anxious uh, of what's happening? Because we hear so much more of it that we assume mm -hmm. more is happening. But it's probably a similar amount mm -hmm. but prior to all of this technology we didn't know this stuff was happening in the world there were countries we didn't even know existed you know <laughs> that now we know there's a tragedy in it you know mm -hmm. so yeah and instant and we know instantly and we see pictures yeah. and video and i think i've had to i've had to i've had a bunch of freelance jobs where i do social media so i'd i'd be forced to be online um mm -hmm. and do a lot of things online and what i had to do was do a very low information diet where i would um have fasts of course from from technology and from media but also just extremely limit what i was going to do and i had i carried that over even after my jobs ended because um it isn't it doesn't help me the more local i i stay with my my social interactions and with the information I know, the better off I am mentally, mm -hmm. like what I can actually do in the world. Like I can only really affect people right here unless I'm just right. like writing checks or something, but I don't have any yeah. money to do that. <laughs> so, um, and it probably wouldn't even be that helpful, but I can help people nearby. And so right. to me, it's like, where am I going to be best useful? And I think there have been some studies recently that showed the high levels of anxiety of people who are like constantly looking at the so social media and, and news feeds and things. There's there, I think there is a, a demonstrated corollary. Oh, there, so. there definitely is because part of that goes back to, you know, when I look at what is like the root of the anxieties and you look at it as fear, well, what is the root of that fear comes out to, well, it's something that's unknown or also uncontrollable. Yeah, well, right. know, I think when, when we hear of all these things around the world and, and if, you know, you're a, typically a caring, sensitive person, right. it, it's probably going to cause you a lot of anxiety because, you know, like you said, there's not much we can do to influence the world. We can influence mm -hmm. our local world, uh, mm -hmm. our family world, but the world in general, not much we can do. And I think for a lot of people, that's that frustration that I can't control that. I can't you know, do anything. So I'm frustrated and then I get angry and then I get anxious and, you know, it, it all wraps around that fear of just knowing too much. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, we are past nine. So yes. I, I have, I purposefully do not plug my dinosaur of a computer in because I noticed on the, one of the previous uh, chats I did that there was a lot of feedback in in the headphones and the mm -hmm. guy I was I was speaking with. So my my power battery life is dwindling down. So I really only <laughs> have like an hour. But this has been so fun, Chris, and I really yes. appreciate that we could do this. And I hope we can do it at least every other week. Uh, and maybe every week we'll have to see about some topics mm -hmm. and see about some times. If this works out well, we can we could do I'd like to do consistently and and get some topics right. and get some people in here to talk to and it's it's really fun to me and i hope you would yeah. like to do it too oh I, I totally agree that this has been a great time and and i hope that anybody who's been out there listening has enjoyed it too but mm -hmm. even if not i've enjoyed it that's my mindful uh, moment so <laughs> yeah and uh, well, and for anybody who wants to get in touch with you they can get in touch with me at sparkmymuse.com and the best place to reach you is is where is on my website which is lifesjourneyblog.com life's journey blog good okay that's great so yeah if you're out there and you watch the show thank you so much for watching the show and and uh stay tuned on twitter for probably we'll be announcing the next one mm -hmm. that in that way and um, that would be great have a good night chris yeah.